Really, what I want to encourage people to do, and it's on a purely voluntary basis, but is to ask people to wear masks, both indoors and outdoors, to wear masks whenever you're around people uh, as much as possible as a preventative. Mayor Blangiardi says bringing back the mask mandate is a possibility. I think anything remains a possibility while we're still in this pandemic. We hope that that won't be the case. Um, I think a lot of it's going to depend on, on on where these lines go. And if the models of the cases begin to pick up uh, and we start, you know, getting crowded at the hospitals, um, I think that that's a possibility. Hawaii continues to see an increase in COVID-19 cases and deaths. In the latest weekly report issued this morning, the state confirmed 7,149 new coronavirus infections in the past seven days. There were also 12 additional fatalities. For a complete breakdown of all these latest numbers, go to your HNN digital platforms. We have a story published there. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for watching. This is now our other big story today. There is a threat of severe weather for the islands. For the latest on that, meteorolo meteorologist Jennifer Robbins is joining us. So what's in the forecast, Jen? We haven't seen this for quite some time, Ash. We're talking about a cold front coming through. And also, we've been seeing the muggy conditions. And also, with that in mind, you can see all the clouds associated with this front. It's initially going to start off over the Garden Isle. And because of that, we're going to be seeing some changes there initially. We're talking about heavy downpours, some thunderstorms, a possibility. You can see the thick cloud coverage that's already coming into the picture ahead of the front. And the front itself is going to mainly impact the Garden Isle. We're talking about maybe five to six inches of rain after this is all said and done there but where there are thunderstorms easily that number could increase and you can see on the outer bands now approaching the west side and also we're seeing that on the north shore and we will start seeing things pick up throughout the day so the commute this evening could be a little bit messy and dicey as you know so we'll definitely have to keep a very close eye on the sky as we take a closer look at some of these outer bands we're talking about a half an inch to one inch per hour for now and it's persistent though it's especially when we get what's called orographic lifting here. That's when the winds hit the terrain and then carries the rain and sque squeezes out more showers. We could see more showers there. And also the other story that we're talking about, it's a La Nina year. All right, Jen, and some even more developing weather news. We just got that outlook from the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. They held a press conference just moments ago. I want to play out just a bit of that press conference. That we will most likely have below average tropical cyclone activity in the Central Pacific as a whole. The outlook is for two to four tropical cyclones that includes tropical depressions, tropical storms, and hurricanes. Uh, it's important to note that the outlook doesn't necessarily pinpoint where those tropical cyclones might occur. Again, that's the outlook from the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Jen, can you break that down for us a little bit? Well, the past three years have been La Nina years. So we can look back at the past couple of years and kind of decide where will we stand this year. So you use past data to look at that. So last year, we were predicting about two to five storms. They scaled that back a little bit this year at two to four, but it only takes one as we know. Remember last year, we had Tropical Storm Linda. It started off as a oh, hurricane, yeah. and that came right over the islands, dumped a whole lot of rain over on Maui. And the previous year, remember in 2020, when we had Douglas yes, and we were just yeah. on the edge, Edge. And those were both La Nina years. So even though it's a La Nina year where there's cooler than normal sea surface temperatures at the equator, as you can see in this graphic here, it's actually 1.2 degrees cooler than average. And that usually means our hurricane season isn't as active. And that's why they're forecasting below average. But we still can see storms. And also with La Nina, um, the third year in a row we've been seeing that. The last time we saw that was 1973 and 1976, that time period. 19 
1998 and 2001, and again this year. So like I was saying, you look at past years where we had this kind of data before to depict that kind of forecast, and that's what they've been seeing. And so we are going to be seeing probably below average when it comes to sea surface temperatures. But then when things start heating up for us, come probably, let's say, late July into August, we could actually be seeing some big changes in the forecast where things heat up, and that will give it enough fuel where we could have some tropical cyclones develop. But usually you could have the trade winds that develop a little bit stronger during this scenario, and that's why we're seeing cooler sea surface temperatures at the equator. And then that's a big impact on the mainland. Probably the next couple of months is we're approaching spring. They're going to be seeing probably a horrendous tornado season like we did the last couple of seasons with La Nina. Also drought conditions on the mainland as well. And then you see the storm track is going to be staying well to the north so that polar air stays towards Canada. But here at home, we'll continue our drought conditions as well. We'll likely be seeing drought conditions like we have been the last couple of um, months into this season as well. We're hoping for the wet season to get some storms. But remember last year, we also had that Kona low in January. Oh, yeah. So we could have maybe those kind of scenarios where we'll have these long periods of dry um, periods, but then a Kona low will develop. And like today, we have a storm system northwest of the island chain. We're hoping for rain because we're under these drought conditions, but below average when it comes to hurricanes projected, but that doesn't mean that a hurricane won't be coming our way, so we'll definitely have to be prepared. And uh, Jen, real quick, just a couple seconds left. How accurate are these outlooks? It's pretty accurate. Um, last year, we had three that came into the um, Central Pacific and just the outer edge of the Central Pacific. And we had one storm, Linda, that came right over us. And they were predicting about two to five. So they were in that ballpark. And I think um, we could be in that range again tomorrow. Or I mean, into the season. We're talking about two to four. We could be falling anywhere from one storm, two storms, up to four storms within the Central Pacific. But like I said, it only takes one that crosses over and that's why we need to be prepared now. Yeah, and Hawaii residents are pretty good about that, oh, right? Yeah. Having their hurricane kits year-round. Yeah, don't be the last-minute guy yeah. that goes to Costco. Do it now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, let's get to some other news, Ash. Yeah, that's right. Wall Street, crazy day. Stocks closed sharply lower on Wall Street after dismal results from Target renewed fears that inflation is battering U.S. companies. That's today's talker. <laughs> S&P 500, the benchmark for many index funds, fell 4%. Target lost a quarter of its value, dragging other retailers down with it after saying its profit fell by half in the latest quarter as costs for freight and transportation spiked. That comes a day after Walmart cited inflation for its own weak results. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped more than 1,100 points or 3.6%, and the Nasdaq pulled back 4.7%. State leaders say restoring tourism from Japan is vital to Hawaii's economic recovery. Governor Ige recently traveled to Japan. He says many Japanese want to come here, but returning to Japan is still a huge hassle due to COVID. They are requiring post-arrival testing of everybody, uh, and I experienced that. You know, we went through, it took us two hours to get through the airport, you had to take a PCR test. They did not release us until we got a negative result. Uh, and I could see in talking with many of our travel partners, it's typical that um, travelers would be in the airport for five hours or more until they could get tested. And clearly, people don't want to travel if they have to put up with that. So, so you as governor had to be in the airport for for two hours. Yes. And you're a public official. Yes. So yesterday, flights from Japan brought just 408 people to Hawaii, including flight crews. Before the pandemic, we were getting more than 4,000 people per day from Japan. Well, eyes are on that Senate race in Pennsylvania. For more on that, we're joined now by Hawaii News Now's chief national political analyst, Greta Van Suster. Now, Greta, why is this race so important? 
Oh, Ashley, this is important not just to Pennsylvania, but to all the people of Hawaii and every other uh, state in the, in the union because of this. The Senate is split 50-50, and in Pennsylvania, that is an open Republican seat since Senator Pat Toomey is retiring. So naturally, the Republicans want the strongest candidate so they can keep that seat. Democrats want to win that seat because they would love come November. They'd love to have the Senate be 51 to 49 and not 50-50. So that's a very important seat. Naturally, the Republicans really want to hang on to it. President Trump endorsed uh, Dr. Oz and uh, David McCormick. Who the, the race still hasn't been called. David McCormick is very close, neck and neck with uh, Dr. Oz. There's probably going to have to be an automatic uh, recount in that state. They're so close. Uh, but the interesting thing about Dave McCormick is his wife was on the National Security Council of President Trump. And Hope Hicks, who's been very close to President Trump uh, for years and has side all through the 2016 race and the 2020 race, well, she's on the campaign team of David McCormick and President Trump instead endorsed uh, Dr. Oz. So lots of drama, but, but it's a very important race because that could tip the Senate. A lot, the same is true, though, for the race in North Carolina. That's an open seat as well. Yeah, speaking of former President Trump, does he still have a pretty strong influence over the GOP? I think it's fair to say that the GOP is his right now. And every single candidate who runs on the Republican ticket wants his endorsement, or practically everyone. I mean, even though we talked about Dave McCormick a second ago, is that even though he wasn't endorsed by President Trump, he went around talking, praising President Trump because he's, you know, he's trying, because so many voters, and especially primary voters, that's your most passionate part of your political base. They, they're, they are very passionate about uh, President Trump. So, yes, President Trump, that's still his party. He has a couple, he has a lot of, a lot of check marks in the win category in terms of promise, uh, uh, primaries, uh, he has a couple losses. Last night, for instance, he had endorsed in North Carolina Congressman Cawthorn, who was defeated. But I'm not so sure anything could have helped uh, Congressman Cawthorn because he has been steeped in horrible scandals recently. So I don't, I, I don't see how an endorsement from anybody could have helped him because he, he seemed pretty doomed from the, from the get-go. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he, you know, he was defeated and President Trump did endorse him. So uh, President Trump's uh, detractors are pointing that out, that, uh, you know, that, you know, that President Trump's candidate didn't win. But I'm not so sure anything could have helped uh, Congressman Cawth Cawthorn in uh, North Carolina. Yeah, that was unlikely. Uh, the governor's race in Pennsylvania getting a lot of attention, too. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's a very important race. The Democratic nominee and the one who's going to run on the Democratic Party, Josh Shapiro, really wanted a man named Mastriano to win. That's the candidate that President Trump endorsed. And indeed, he did win. But the reason why the Democrat wanted to win is he thinks he's a, a weaker candidate in November because Mastriano is very far to the right. He attended the Stop the Steal rally on January 6th. Um, if, if elect, whoever is governor gets to uh, select the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State is the one who is, is over the guardian over the elections, and uh, Mr. Mastriano still wants uh, to have the Pennsylvania uh, race from 2020 with President Trump uh, Recounted, re-audited. So he's he's very far to the right. Of course, um, Josh Shapiro is very far to the left. But um, it's a very interesting race to watch because you know because Pennsylvania, all eyes are on Pennsylvania, and it was so. And of course, all the controversy in 2020. Um, but indeed, uh, Mastriano, endorsed by President Trump, did win, and President Trump is taking that as a check mark in his win category for uh, primaries. All right, turning to the pandemic now, Greta. You know, after a six-week hiatus, the White House held its first on-camera. COVID briefing today, what were the big key takeaways? Well, Dr. Zha is the new uh, coordinator for the White House in, uh, for, for COVID. And the reason the White House came back is because the White House is looking for more money from Congress. It says it needs more funding for more vaccines, for um, variants uh, for the American people, for those who want it. They don't think that the, there's going to be enough. They need more money for test kits as well. Remember last fall, um, that, uh, that President Biden, that everyone predicted there'd be a surge around Christmas time. Everybody gathered together on Thanksgiving. Indeed, there was a surge. But the Biden administration was highly criticized because they didn't pay much attention to it. They didn't get a lot of, uh, a lot of test kits out to people. And so they got criticized. So, well, fast forward to now, and a lot of the experts think that there will be a surge uh, this summer and this fall. And I think that, um, that politically, besides the fact that the president wants to make sure the country is safe, is that politically it makes sense to sort of get out in front of it and show that, you know, that he really cares and the White House is really attentive. So thus they had uh, this White House briefing. All right, Greta Van Susteren, Hawaii News Now's Chief National Political Analyst. We appreciate you, Greta. Thank you.
New today, black box data recovered from a plane that crashed in China in March suggests that someone intentionally downed the plane. Stephen Jing has much more on this story from Beijing. Even before the Wall Street Journal story was published, there had been a lot of speculations on Chinese internet about this crash being caused by pilot suicide. Because uh, as many experts have pointed out, a mature aircraft type like the Boeing 737-800 simply doesn't fall out of the sky. Now, Chinese officials had previously strongly denied those so-called rumors, but after the journal article was published, we have seen the airline industry regulator here, CAAC, issue a statement to state media basically saying they have reached out to their American counterparts at the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. And what the Americans have told the Chinese, according to CAAC, was that they have not released information about the investigation to any media outlets. So notice how carefully worded both sides have been. Neither the Americans nor the Chinese have directly denied the crux of the journal report, which was this deadly crash was caused by human inputs from the cockpit. Now, analysts and the uh, observers have also pointed out to some hints and suggestions that the Chinese authorities may be concerned about, if not aware, of the human factors involved in this crash. Because on April 6th, just a few weeks after this crash, the uh, CAAC authorities uh, held a nationwide conference on air safety with the Minister of Civil Aviation actually urging officials across the country to pay particular attention to pilots' state of mind, saying all frontline employees, but especially pilots, need to be physically and mentally fit to fly to ensure the safety of the entire industry. And uh, other observers have also pointed out to the fact that the 737-800 series continues to be operated by Chinese airlines after the crash as another sign that this crash was not caused by mechanical or technical failures. Even China Eastern itself, after suspending commercial services of the aircraft type for a brief period of time, has resumed flying this very popular aircraft across China. Stephen Zhang, CNN. Beijing. The feds have approved a path for United Airlines to resume using dozens of Boeing 777 jets that have been grounded since the engine on one of the planes blew apart over Denver last year. The FAA confirmed that it has approved the necessary steps for flights to resume using the planes which have engines made by Pratt and Whitney. The planes were grounded in February of 2021 after a Hawaii-bound plane suffered an engine failure shortly after takeoff and rained down debris over the Denver area. You'll recall this dramatic video. The pilots were able to return to the Denver airport and land safely. United says some of the planes will be back in use within a week. The 52 planes account for nearly 10% of United's passenger carrying capacity. Toyota, Nissan, GM, Ford, you name it, the big automakers are all going electric. But the problem is a lack of public charging stations. Casey Lund has more. Aloha from the Hiko Electric Vehicle Charging Station here off Ward Avenue, just across from the Blaisdell. Come with me, I want to show you one of these units, these DC fast charging units. There are about 10 of these on Oahu, about 25 statewide. Now the utility says they want to add 300 across the state. Uh, by the year 2030, they're going to have about 60% on Oahu, 20% on Maui County, and 20% on Hawaii Island. But even state lawmakers, the DOT and consumers especially, say that still may not be enough for the number of electric vehicles that we have in this state. We want to cite Honolulu Civil Beat that did some great work in in-depth reporting on this issue. It's a closer look at the reality of Hawaii trying to meet its bold energy agenda goals by the year 2045. 100% clean energy. That means zero emissions. For those who are in the market for an electric vehicle, it's a simple matter of choice and necessity. I spoke yesterday with Daniela Spoto, who was in the market for an EV. She tells me the lack of charging stations made her rethink her decision. Yeah, and you know, now that gas prices are going up so much more, I'm really reconsidering this choice and looking at potentially, you know, revisiting my decision. I think one of the things that's been kind of scary that's coming up recently is talking to my friends who have EVs um, and just hearing the struggles that they're having finding places to go charge them. Um, I guess I'm a little bit scared of ending up somewhere and you know, if it was a, a gas vehicle, I could just go drop into the gas station and fill it up. But if I'm running out somewhere um, where there's no place to charge it and all of the charging stations are full, 
then I would hate to be stranded. Daniela is not alone in her hesitation to switch to electric. It's a difficult move to make, especially if you live in a condo or an apartment complex where the technology just isn't there. Listen to what State Senator Chris Lee had to say about giving incentives to businesses like malls, condos, and apartment complex to add more EV charging stations. If you live in a condo, for example, do you as a condo owner pay to put in a charging station in your garage or does the association have responsibility? There's a lot of questions. So what we did was we passed legislation this year to expand financing programs to help provide grants for folks who want to put those kinds of things in. We have $18 million in federal funds that are going to put in public charging stations up and down the uh, freeway corridors. And we have a plan for DOT and our energy office to expand the network of charging stations um, and really ramp that up to exceed the kind of expected demand that we're seeing. Ed Sniffen is the deputy director of the Division of Highways for the state's Department of Transportation. He says that we are making progress, but we have a lot more work to do. The policies that are in place right now from the state and local level are doing a pretty good job of setting the tone for the charging infrastructure as necessary. Um, but definitely when we have our, our aggressive 2045 clean energy goals that, that Hawaii has, uh, we're, we are nowhere near where we, need, where we need to be. So the great thing is legislature is getting involved to ensure that we, there's more funding going, uh, moving towards that. The federal government is providing a bunch of money um, to ensure that all states can move forward very, very quickly on, on electrification. State lawmakers have passed a number of bills this last legislative session to incentivize more drivers to adopt electric vehicles, but more importantly, more of those private businesses to add more electric vehicle charging stations. We have in-depth coverage of this issue online at hawaiinewsnow.com. For now, we'll send things back to you. It's time for What You Watch on Wednesday, and Paramount Global just released moments ago a vast new slate of programming for its platforms. Let's turn things over now to Dana Tyler from New York with more on that. Fire Country, based on California's inmate firefighter program, is one of three new dramas debuting on CBS this fall. Can I, uh, can I use the phone to call my lawyer? Sure. You have phone privileges in a week. Max Terriot is both the star and an executive producer. He says a lot of the show is based on people he grew up with in a small northern California town. I think everybody realized, like, wait a second, we can get firefighters and prisoners in the same show fighting fire together and it's real. And, you know, I think from a from a storytelling standpoint, it just gives you so much stuff to explore. Mom, I know who Witness Always 16 is. Skylar Aston co-stars with Academy Award winner Marsha Gay Harden in So Help Me Todd. It's about a lawyer who hires her aimless son as her law firm's investigator. For those of you who don't know, my name is Regina Haywood. And the gritty new police drama East New York stars Amanda Warren as the newly promoted boss of a Brooklyn precinct. So this is a no holds punches. We are here to tell the truth and really tap into the human condition. Joining the Wednesday night all reality lineup is a new romance adventure competition series inspired by the love boat called the real love boat. I may have put a curse on you and Jay. Excuse me? Among CBS's 18 returning shows, the number one new series, okay. Ghosts, starring Rose McIver. It's fun. People get to enjoy some of the humor in it. Perhaps this is a good time for a physics joke. The hit comedy Young Sheldon will also be back, as will the number one broadcast series, NCIS. Dana Tyler, CBS News, New York. And McDonald's announced a new McFlurry called Chocolatey Pretzel. It's vanilla soft serve ice cream with chocolate covered pretzel bits topped with caramel swirl. Goes on sale May 25th. Oh, yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. Looking yummy. And one more good news to get to you guys. And if you're a messy eater like me, listen up. <laughs> There's a new invention out there to help make that mess a little easier. John Hopkins University designed Tasty Tape. It's an adhesive that is sure to keep the items inside wraps like tortillas. <laughs> it's made out of a food grade fiber scaffold and an edible adhesive. And there it is now. It's actually clear, but they made it blue just for the demonstration <laughs> of that video. That's all we got today on This Is Now. Ash is back first at 4 on KHNL.